Good morning, good morning, Crossroad. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? amen? I had two or three people ask me this morning, you going to tell us a joke this morning? I said, no, I got something better than a joke. He is risen. And that's no joke, amen? That's good. It's good to see you. I'm glad that you decided to share Easter morning with Crossroad family. Amen? It's a good place to be. And let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. Once again, Lord, we just, we absolutely grieve that the torture, the pain, and the things that you went through on the cross, Lord, knowing that that was necessary to save humanity. Lord, you, you gave yourself for us that through your work on the cross, Lord, we, we could experience an intimate relationship with you, Lord Jesus, for the rest of our lives. And because you chose to sacrifice yourself, Lord, you have enabled us, those of us that are believers, Father God, to go out and minister to the world that you died to redeem. You're an awesome God. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence here this morning. Have your way with us and with the, the special speakers that we'll be sharing this morning. We give you honor and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Come on and stand to your feet if you're glad to be in the house one more time. Come on and put your hands together. We're here to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on this morning. Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands. The song says, God is not dead, but yet he is still. Explode and bring the dead to life. A love so bold to see a revolution somehow. Let love explode and bring the dead to life. Hey, a love so bold to see a revolution somehow. Now I'm gone.
Come on, come on, come on and let your praise rise. That's not for any of us. That's for Jesus. Has Jesus changed your life? Does anybody want to see things that they have never seen before? Come on. Are there any family members that you're thinking about right now that you would love to see Jesus do for them what he's done for you? church what about those that have come through those doors just thinking that they were going to attend a show that's not what we do here at crossroad we like to celebrate jesus and there's a reason you see some of us were sick but now we're healed some of us had lost relationship but relationships have been restored Jesus saves. He has, he does, and he will continue to save. There is a power that abides in our hearts that stirs up. You know what that power is? It's his resurrection power. The same power that he, that rose him up from that grave is stirring within our hearts. And it transcends from our hearts to our minds into our actions. The way that we spoke before no longer is how we speak. How we went about doing life no longer is the way that we conduct ourselves. We are forever transformed. Thank you, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, just like we sang, He's going to and fro. And the Father wants to... He wants to show you how mighty he is. So pray with me really quick. Simple prayer. You ready for this? Father, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Holy Spirit, open our eyes so that we can see Jesus as never before. As never before.
but I see that the grave is empty, then you know what I know, anything is possible. Do you see what I see, that the grave is empty, then you know what I know, anything is possible.
There is no name higher that's been given among men, both in heaven or on earth, than that awesome, that mighty, that powerful name of Jesus. Lord, you have saved before, and our prayer is simple. Do it again. May you reach into the deepest parts of our hearts, the recesses in our mind. Turn us, O oh God. Help us to see you in ways that we've never understood you to be. That exposed to the greatness of you, that we would see how wretched is our life, is our heart, is our soul that we would know that only by coming to you that we would live our fullest life. Draw us, Holy Spirit, as only you can do, and we will be saved. We thank you. We bless your holy name. Thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. In the strong and mighty name, of Jesus Christ, we say amen. Amen. But this is uh, our Easter Sunday, and, and at Crossroads, for all 20, 20 years of our history, we've had uh, s- somebody else share. I remember I had one pastor said, I, I can't believe you're, you're the pastor of the church. You don't even speak on Easter. And well, I say a little bit. I'm saying something right now. But we've always had some testimonies of what God has done, and it's been a powerful 20 Easter's or so that we've done it. And today we have uh, two people that are going to be sharing with us. And, And you see, if we're believers, and we say we are, and we're here because of why? Easter, that means because Jesus resurrected, he was dead, and he is alive. You know, now, if that's just religion to us, then we can be here and be no different than anybody else. But if it's a relationship with a living God, that's incredible. I don't know how it was for you. I was religious. I showed up to church. I, told you, I would have told you I believed in God. That's wonderful. But I was in charge of my life. My family went to church, so I went to church. And I believed in God, and I'd pray to him if I wanted to. I'd say a blessing at a table if I wanted to. But who was in charge of my life? I was. No, nobody told me that my whole life would change when he was in charge. And that the whole purpose of the cross, the whole purpose of everything about that was that he could have a relationship with me in, in the very essence that the one who made me is now the one who's leading me by the power of his life in me. How was that going to happen? By the cross. My sins would be paid for. My debt would be along with everybody else's. And that opportunity would be there for me. If there's no power in our life, this is pointless. You know, it's nice that we can do this, but really, if he's not resurrected from the dead, we could be, you know, I could be playing golf. Hey, uh, you know, what is Easter if he's not really resurrected? But here's the thing. Oh, he is resurrected. He is alive. And when I invited him in, I did not know as a 13 year old how my life could change from the moment I got up off my knees. I was in a bedroom by myself, read a track that simply told me for the first time what I needed to do in my life. I did it and did not know the world that I was being introduced to, the world of, an, of a God who was actually alive, who would now start interacting with me. Paul said it this way in Romans, Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. That is not mental assent. That is not religiosity. That's not just showing up for church. This is a life that is living for him. This is a life that is now believes in him that now in relationship, he's in charge. His name is Lord and Savior, meaning he's in charge. When that happens, I'm telling you, that's when the power shows up. 
you know, the Bible speaks about if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, then he will quicken this mortal body. Literally, before he raises us up from the dead, he'll start changing us right here, all by the power of that spirit. When Jesus resurrected and met with his disciples, he said, do not leave Jerusalem until you are endued with what? Power. When the Holy Spirit came, when the presence of God was able to live within us, we would have power to be witnesses, power to show that God really was alive. And, and see, if you came here today and it's just a religious thing, well, you, you may not even know what I'm talking about. I tell stories of what God has done in my life and, and my family's life and, and, and different situations. And you may not know what that is if you're just religious. But if you're in relationship, That power is going to start giving you stories. You don't go after stories. You go after the God of the story. And when you walk with him, I'm telling you, things will begin to happen. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek, meaning the whole world. For in it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That word comes, the spirit pricks your heart, and you begin to be changed. You have a moment of faith to believe him, and everything will continue that same way. The word will come alive in you. You'll have a moment to believe that, and it'll happen again and again, and you'll find yourself growing, being changed, conformed to look like him more and more every day. This is the power of God working in your life, forming Christ in you. You cannot do it without the power of God. We live this life by the power of God. We will run into miracles by the power of God. We will have life-changing events for us and and people we know because of the power of God. Then this one in Ephesians. This is used as a benediction many times, but this is Paul again. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Isn't that pretty big? More than you could ask or think. I'm telling you, when I came to the Lord, I wouldn't know how to ask for what's happened in my life. It's bigger than I could have asked for. Even when he would tell me what I was going to do, I couldn't ask correctly for what God was going to do. Literally, by his power, he will do more than you could ever ask or think. How? According to the power that works in us. What's that power? The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God working in us, making a difference. To him be glory in the church or be revealed in his church. People will see God in his church. By Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, plenty of people have come and seen hypocrisy in people that call themselves the church. I've had plenty of people say, I don't go to church, they're full of hypocrites. Well, if he meant sinners, you know, people or people that aren't perfect, yeah, we're not perfect, but we're being perfected in God. If we're walking with him, we are being changed. But I'm telling you, I love being here. I know we have failings and people fall, and, but I love watching people grow in the Lord. When we do these multiple services, if I didn't see people being changed, it would be point. I, I don't need to be doing three and four services. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't need to be doing that, except that God's doing the work in people. And when I see where, how far he's, t- I'm looking around just seeing people how far I've, I've seen them come. And the two that are going to share today, it's been amazing to watch how far they have come to where they were, to where God has brought them, to how God saved them and then changed them. And then even in the midst of life, had something more for them. Even when they hit struggles, God still had more. And uh, the first uh, that's going to share is, is our sister Lynn Brown. I see Lynn right there. She's married to Pastor Ken, and uh, they help us in in counseling and They've done our marriage seminars, and when Lynn shared at the marriage seminar, I told Ken, boy, you got a gem there. You guys are a dynamic duo. She, she did amazing in the, in the seminar process. And she's over there most of the time with Ken when they get to pray for new believers. 
but it's been awesome to watch what God has done, to be in this walk with them when they first came and just to see God do this dynamic change in them, bringing them to a place of being wonderful counselors here. Uh, and our second person who's going to share is, is Bill Pepper. And I'm not sure where you're at, Bill. Oh, all the way in the back, hiding in the back. There you are, Bill. Bill Pepper, uh, when I started dating my wife, Gail, who's, by the way, it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, Gail. I don't know if she's even listening. I don't know. But happy birthday, Gail. When I started dating Gail, uh, when I would go to her church, her church is Grace Church in Milton, and the Peppers were there. And uh, got to meet all them and see, really, people of heart and dedication to God, people who cared to see people get saved. And it was wonderful to, 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 to watch them as God did some incredible things there during that time that we were there at Grace. And then to have, have them to see Bill and, and Tom and uh, the, the two brothers come here with their families it was just a blessing because it was like home folks coming. And just, that's awesome when that happens for me. And he's going to share what God has done in his life and even something just more recently in his life of, of how he's experiencing even more the, the power of God that's in his life because he, he surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Lynn come first, and when she's done, uh, then Brother Bill, you come right on up and be a part of this. And why don't you welcome them as they come. Lynn, Lynn Brown. Good morning, church. You know, every service is different, so I've just got to kind of look around and get my bearings. I see some family members, I see some co-workers, some loved ones, all of my beautiful church family, and I just want to welcome you and wish you a happy Resurrection Sunday. You know, I will say this, this third service I can get off track right from the get-go, right? (laughs) I will say this, though. When Pastor Rick first asked me to speak, I was like, no, I think you mean Ken. I think you want Ken to speak. He's the pastor, right? He's got the training. I think you want him to speak. I'm an educator, so there's no shortage of talking that happens in my life. I'm also a woman, so, you know, (laughs) double. Um, So I I can talk, but I've kind of been kicking, you know, that doubt around in my mind about why me. But the praise team, who did such an awesome job all weekend... I just, I thank them for their service. So much is involved in that. But the praise team reminded me this morning of exactly why Pastor asked me to speak. Through the words that they sang, you know, it's, it's through his name that we come alive to declare his victory. And so that's what I'm here to do this morning. I'm, to de- I'm here to declare his victory in my life. And I hope that in spite of me and in spite of my... Um, distractedness, so this is so I don't get distracted, in spite of my feeble attempts, that you will hear what the Lord wants to say to you, because he has something he wants to say to you, and I just hope that he will do that this morning, so let's get started. So happy Resurrection Sunday, I'm glad you're here, there's so many of you that look familiar to me, I see you week to week, so it it makes me feel comfort to know that you're here to hear and worship with us. But I also see some new faces, and I'm thankful that you're here, that something got you here this morning, and that something is the Lord. And, and, and again, he has something he wants to say to you. He has more that he wants in your life, and I hope that you will hear that. And if you're joining us online, and I'm not going to lie, it freaks me out a little bit that there's people watching online right now. <laughs> but if you're joining online, if that's the way that you're getting your worship on, on Easter morning, welcome welcome. We're we're thankful that you're here, however you're here, however you feel. I just want you to put it all aside. So this is Easter season, Resurrection Sunday. The season marks the time when Jesus Christ ended his ministry here on the earth to ascend to heaven or return to his Father. Through the loving sacrifice of his life, he covered our sin with his perfect life. His perfect spotless life makes us righteous, makes us holy, so that we can have confidence that when our life on this earth is over, that we can live forever with him in glory. That sounds almost too good to be true, but we have some responsibility for that to be true. Our responsibility is we have to accept him. We have to know him. We have to acknowledge him for who he is and then agree that we need him because we all do. We all need him. Quite simply, we have to align ourselves to his purposes for our life. And if you're wondering what you're here for, 
He has a purpose and a plan for your life. Ask him. He'll start to tell you. It starts with saying yes to Jesus. Saying yes to his will and his way, his plans and his purposes. Will we get that right every time? Of course not. Just because we have Jesus doesn't mean we're perfect. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, if you look over in the book of James, it's going to tell you that we are being perfected. And Pastor shared that earlier. We are all a work in progress. But the good news is saying yes to Jesus is the beginning of our journey in hev- journey to heaven. And what a glorious life we can have when we decide to give our lives back to the one who gave his life for us. I first said yes to Jesus as a teenage girl back in my pastor's wife's Sunday school class. She had Sunday school in her living room in their home, which was adjacent to the church. And every week she would pray at the end of class, much, much like I'm sure our Our older Sunday school classes go right now, and I'm certain I've I've been blessed to be able to teach in the first and second grade class for the last year, and I love it, and I love them, and we pray there, and your heart would melt at the prayers of those six- and seven-year-old children, but my, my heart prayed that prayer when I was about 15, 16 years old in her home, and I asked Jesus into my heart, and I'm pretty sure every time I've heard it since then, Every time pastor gives an offer, I'm like, yes, again, because I want to just make sure not only am I good with God, but that I'm making that decision and again, and that I'm resetting and reminding myself each and every time that I'm saying yes to him again. So that's where it started, saying yes to Jesus as a teenager. But my life has certainly taken many detours and a few U-turns along the way. I'm not sure if any of you can relate to this, but I haven't always put Christ first. I've always known he was right there with me, but I haven't always given him his proper place. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, he tells us, I will never leave you or forsake you. So I knew he was always with me. It was I who wasn't always with him. But we are never alone. There's nowhere we can go that he isn't already there. There's nothing we can even think about or do, which which is why when we make choices that are against him, when we get what we call convicted, how we feel about the things that we're doing, We get convicted. We should be uncomfortable when we do things that are against Christ, when we do things that aren't aligned with his purposes, that aren't aligned with his goals for us. We should never take Jesus anywhere that he wouldn't choose to go, whether that's in our physical life or our thought life or anything else. Because again, we're never alone. He's always right alongside us. So today I'm going to share the resurrection story of our marriage, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you. Many of you know that Ken is the counseling pastor here, as pastor has already said, so I'll just kind of go ahead and skip over that part. We've done a few things here at church, things that we enjoy, things that have been really dear to us. So it probably doesn't come as a surprise to you that I'm going to speak about marriage this morning. But the resurrection story of our marriage is a resurrection story of of a very different kind. So first, I went to my dictionary. Again, I I mentioned that I'm a teacher. I've been teaching the public school system for 24 years, and and I've pretty much done every single job. And with COVID, I could say I've literally done every single job because, um, yeah, the the, the rules and the regulations that came along with that, we became the lunch crew. We became the cleaning crew. We certainly joined alongside the folks that did that. So I, I... I've pretty much had every role. But as a teacher, I like to think and learn and expand what I know. So I went to the dictionary, and so I looked up resurrection. And one of the words that was listed there with resurrection was restoration. And I like that. I like thinking about that concept of restoration, being restored, being made whole. So we know Jesus' literal resurrection was God raising him from the dead and his return to the Father in heaven after living some 33 years here on the earth. Jesus had a powerful ministry in his final three short years on earth, and he was then restored to his heavenly father and restored to his heavenly position in heaven with him. Hopefully, it should be our hope that when we breathe our last here on earth, that we too will be resurrected, reunited with our Savior in heaven. So to begin our story... Ken and I were married quite speedily, almost 22 years ago now, following a whirlwind courtship. (laughs) We felt certain we were God's provision for one another. Now, we don't recommend anyone else careen quite as fast as we did to the altar, unless you're getting saved. But we did have a few friends warn us that it might be a good, good idea to slow down 
And I would just say to you that now that we're older and wiser and a whole lot grayer, we would, we would advise the same that you take the opportunity to see a person, if you're in the dating stage of your life or if any of the teens are in the room, take the opportunity to see a person through all seasons and get to know them and just see a person through all situations. Our friends mentioned this, but we were not detained. First, we believe that God's design is for one man and one woman to marry and remain that way for life. This is God's best for us. We know that. Anytime we deviate for what's God's, what is God's best for us, we could have problems, and often do. And those, conse- pro- those problems often lead to consequences, which are sometimes not very pleasant. But even still, he can use all things to bring us closer to him, even our own poor decisions. So suffice it to say, just be in, in, the effort, in the effort of transparency, both of us had a failed marriage that ended in divorce prior to marrying one another. And the pain of those difficult years in between our first marriage and our current marriage led us closer to the Lord. This is one instance of God's faithfulness to us. He tells us in his word that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So one example of this resurrection or restoration of our family, two broken families, but following and depending on him, reconciled to him, were restored into a larger new family to serve him, no differently than he desires from any family. If your marriage is by God's design, thank him for it and learn all that he says about marriage. Learn all that he wants it to be. And if it isn't, I would urge you to feel his forgiveness and hold on because he wants to work there too. He wants to work in the marriage that you are now in. He wants to see it bring ultimate glory to him. So God's restoration was the blessing of a second family. Both of us had been single and waiting for five and seven years. And during the time I was by myself, I would have told you that I was closer to the Lord than I had been at any point in my life. However, I'm recalling a conversation that I had with with a friend and mentor, a Christian friend and mentor. And she tried to explain to me that what I was supposed to be working on while I was waiting was me. I was like, what? Me? It's not me. But after some thought, and after she handed a book to me on the topic, and after I dove into the word and spent some time in prayer, I realized she was exactly right, that I needed to spend time before the Lord and see what type of wife he called me to be. I had much growth to make in order to be the wife that God needed me to be, and still do. And and praise God, he's still growing me into the wife that he wants me to be. So early on in our marriage, we were just plain thankful. I can remember just staring across the table, just smiling at Ken like a silly newlywed, saying, I can't believe it, we're married, we really, you know, just all the silliness. But it was, it was, so, it was so much comfort to know that I had married someone who wanted to follow Christ with me, who wanted to make all of our family that he desired it to be. So we were thankful that we had found exactly what we deemed to be God's provision. But unfortunately, like everyone else, our marriage was made up of two flawed humans. So it wasn't long before marital discord came knocking because no one's immune to selfishness and disharmony. And it showed up at our house. We had to turn to God. We realized we weren't following him as closely as we should because you can't kind of be a diligent follower of Christ. He, ta- he calls us to be diligent seekers of him and his word. And I realize today, as I stand here and tell you this, this completely flies in the face of what the world would say about marriage. But remember, we're not trying to be like them. We're trying to be like the Lord. So we were facing the same types of marital issues that many other folks encounter. We weren't pastor and Mrs. Brown back then. Not that that matters because no one's home is immune to selfishness, as I said before. We had to turn to Christ totally and together and allow the hurts and the disappointments that we had brought into our new family, our marriage, our oneness, to be healed by God himself. So we leaned head and heart first into him. We devoured the word. We both began reading the word just with regularity that we had never done up to that point. And I can't stress enough, like if I just said one thing, that would be it, getting God's word. And I could just sit right down and Many of you probably would prefer that I did, but I'm going to carry on. That 
we look at each other now and say that is the defining feature of our marriage that it could not do without. It could not live without that. It could not live without us seeing one another in the word and the way that that grows us and the way that that makes us the husband and wife that we're called to be. So he calls us, he calls us to be married and be walking with him. And when you do that, look out because you too may not be prepared for all he calls you to. When we submit to him, he's going to have work for you. He's going to have a purpose for you. And we just have to be ready for that, as I already have talked about in saying yes. So just over 10 years ago, Ken felt called into ministry. We felt the call was real. So he went back to school and we knew that if we sold out to this call, that God was going to bless it. And he has, um, true to his word. So Ken was ordained and we continued to say yes to each and every open door that God provided. I will warn you, though, sometimes when you say yes, it can sometimes lead to what at first might seem uncomfortable. However, I was told by a wise man once, my father-in-law, that God, where, where God points, he also provides. And somebody in the last service told me that was the one most important thing I said, so I'm just going to say that again. Where God points, he provides. You can be sure if he calls you, he will equip you. So saying yes doesn't have to be a scary or an uncomfortable situation if we trust the one that's doing the calling. I was recently talking about faith and church and whatnot with a friend of mine. She was telling me about a trip that she wanted to take with her father to the Holy Land, and she was talking about all these details. She was like, I really want to go. My mom doesn't want to go, so dad and I are going to go. It's going to be a bonding experience. They're good Christians. They attend another church nearby, and she was just kind of telling me about this trip, and it sounded very interesting. And I said, you know, I, I think you can just trust God with this. See if he opens doors. If he opens doors and the details work out, then you'll know it's from him. I'll be praying for you. But I just know that I've decided, this is the last thing that I said to her. I said, the la- I've just decided that I'm not going to say no to God. Now, I said that very, like, you know, very glibly, very, very matter-of-factly. I didn't realize I was going to have to eat those words in about five minutes. Got in my car. I drove from her house to my house, literally five minutes. She lives three blocks from me. I look down at my phone, and I have a text from the pastor of one of the churches that Ken and I had done, a marriage at, uh, had done a marriage event at. And he's asking me if I would speak for Mother's Day. And I'm like, whoa, God, that was fast. Like, I just said I wasn't going to say no to God. Now you're asking me to do something. Like, what in the world is going on? But, of course, I texted back and said, I'd be happy to. Oh my gosh, I think I started wringing my hands right away. But I saw this as God showing me that I'd better follow him. I'd better get ready to follow him if I was going to make a statement like that. So it's true for me and it's true for my friend. She did go to the Holy Land with her dad. And I can't wait to hear about the details of that trip. So I am speaking at that other church for Mother's Day. And then about a week later, Pastor Rick says to me, do you think you could share testimony of God's power in your life for Easter? And I'm like, sure, sure I can. And I quickly told him my I'm not saying no to God story, which, of course, you know, everybody laughs because what's he going to ask me to do next? But I'm standing here before you saying that I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid to say yes to God because I know that whatever he, whatever he makes possible, I'm going to follow it because I know he's going to supply the power. I know he's going to make sure you're hearing right now in the midst of my stuttering and in the midst of my tripping over my words, he's going to make sure you hear what he's saying to you today. So I don't have to worry about it. The results aren't on me, as another wise man I know often tells me. So now you've probably heard people say that God can take your mess and make it your message. And I stand before you as a representative of exactly that. Because left up to me, we would still be stuck in that 2000 mess. The year 2000 is the year we got married. But today we're continuing to seek him, trying to reflect him, just trying our best to learn how to follow and be good followers of him. And he's turned our story into ministry, which we could have never done but by his power. What God resurrects, our marriage, he intends to glorify him. So we are in agreement that our marriage will glorify him. So I thank him and I give him the glory for my faith, for my marriage, for my family, and for whatever ministry he wants to see us working in. I'm, a, I'm in agreement with him and I and believing that where his finger points, his hand will provide. When I think about all he's done, I'm grateful and just humbled that he's allowed us and called us just to be his children. I realize that compared to some people's testimonies, this may pale, but our greatest struggle was yet ahead of us. So let me tell you about my final example of God's restoration in our marriage. 
When we all get married, we quickly say our vows, and we quickly say in sickness and in health, and few of us ever stop to think about the waters that we might have to tread regarding our health. I know some of you know what I'm talking about from your own personal experience. Nothing makes you grateful for what you have than knowing that you could lose it. So in 2018, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. This was a serious diagnosis, a shock of a lifetime to us, and it was going to require surgery and treatment. Now, I don't want to... I guess my purpose in telling this is to just highlight the power of God here because certainly all of us have had brushes with health or with injury or with danger. And I'm looking around the... the the congregation, and I'm seeing people who do all kinds of incredible things uh, for a living to protect us and to to keep us safe. This really shook us, but I want to highlight the goodness and power of a good God during this particular challenge in our marriage. I know many of you continue, continue with your own health battles, and I want you to know that our prayers are with you. When we know about it, we pray for you. And as I said earlier, those six- and seven-year-old children down in Sunday school are the most precious prayers. When I tell them it's prayer time and we look at the prayer list that we have on the board, many of them want to pray out loud. Many of them want to share in that praying. And that is so, so important that at a young age they're learning to pray for others. And we're seeing prayers answered. We come back the next week and we share our answers to prayers. And that's incredible. Remember, as I said to you earlier, you're never alone. God is with us in the diagnosis, he's with us in the treatment, and he's definitely with us in the healing. He is the healing. Whether physical healing or take us to heaven healing, he is always with us, just as he promised in his word. I can say that the attitude of my husband, who was the patient, ironically, during this time, was my ongoing strength. Even when his body lacked physical strength, I could count on the spiritual strength. I could count on God's strength and our spiritual strength to see us through every part of it. Ken reinforced for me, and for anyone who would listen really, that though his earthly body had cancer, God was still good, and cancer would not steal the joy that we have in him. Now as his wife, it was tough to listen to him say that. That whatever, whether he returned to health or whether he was taken to heaven, that we would praise and thank God. That was hard at first. But the more time passed and the more he reiterated this to me, the more I realized that even when we don't get our way, God is always being so very good to us. See, God knows the beginning and the end of our story. He knows every mile post along the way. And knowing the road ahead of us, we can always trust God. The result of cancer or any illness, really, is that sometimes we're not the same people as we were before the diagnosis. But praise God if we're listening and growing. We can be assured of his power, of his mercy and his grace. And most of all, his great love for us. If we keep our focus on what we have in him and not on any perceived loss. So we look back on this time, our cancer story, and see the resurrection power of Christ in it too. So as I get ready to wrap up, please know that Ken and I are not special. Like really not at all. We're just really not special. You know, a a couple of middle-agers, empty nesters, a couple of kids that grew up with probably a lot of insecurity that a lot of you can relate to. But God has made each of us to know him, to reflect him, and to glorify him. And he loves all of us. He loves all of his children, even if you don't even know that you're one of his children yet. He loves all of us. We have to recognize what he's done for us. We have to walk in agreement with him and be who he created us to be, which means keep saying yes to sometimes what's going to be uncomfortable. And you too will be overwhelmingly blessed and amazed at what God can do with a willing son or daughter. I hope you will do that. I hope and pray that if today you will decide to follow him. But if you've already said yes, I hope that you'll decide to sell out And follow him wholeheartedly and watch what he can do. I once heard someone say the only difference between you 10 years from now and you today are the people you meet and the books you read. And I remember thinking, hmm, at the time I was an ELA teacher. I didn't know it then, but knowing Jesus 
meeting that person in a close and personal way, and reading his word, the Bible, will provide you with the most complete transformation possible. And those two choices will ensure that 10 years from now, if you aren't already living with him in glory, you will be walking closer with him in this life. Test it out with you, for yourself. Walk with him and watch what he does with your life. Jesus himself was resurrected to glorify his father. And if we allow him to, he can do the same thing in our marriages. Trust him with your very life and allow Christ to supply the power and the healing which has resulted in our resurrection story, which he is continuing, even right now, to use to glorify him. And as you learn to say yes to your Lord, you'll see your resurrection story unfold. Thank you, church. Now I'm just going to throw a challenge out to you as Bill makes his way to the front. One of us teaches little people, and one of us teaches middle schoolers. So just see if you can tell by the body language in the, uh, the presentation. <laughs> oh, man. What a church service. I thought Eli was going to lose control of himself when he was up here. <laughs> in the book of First Peter, it says, always be prepared to give an account for what God's done for you. And I try to do that, and um, I always, I'm always kind of ready to give my testimony, and it's not anything special, like, it's like you know, Lynn said, I'm not, I'm not really that important in this church uh, in terms of anything that I do, and I, there's nothing special about me, but I do have a testimony, when people ask me about it, I, I'm prepared to give it, and I have a testimony that I'm going to share with you, and Pastor uh, Rick he come up to me about a month ago, and he, he was just very quiet. There was only two of us in the hallway. There was nobody else there, and he just real quietly goes, I just I think people would like to hear your testimony, and would you be willing to share? And I think that would be something that would be great for uh, Easter. I looked at him, I was like, yes. I don't even need to think about it. Yes, absolutely. That's an, What an opportunity. God gives me an opportunity to share my testimony. Absolutely. And then I went to bed that night. <clears throat> and I woke up the next morning and I was like, there's going to be like a thousand people here. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to know anybody. I don't even come to the second service. I'm not going to know, I'm, I'm not going to recognize anybody. And I looked up to heaven and I thought, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe. And God said, just stand on a stage and say what I tell you to, to say. So I'm going to try to do that. The problem is Lynn's a lot smarter than I am. She wrote everything down. <laughs> and we've done this three times, last night and, uh, and today, this morning. And after each service, a couple of people come up to me and they go, that was really great. I, I enjoyed listening to what you had to say. And I go, that's nice because I have no idea what came out of my mouth. <laughs> and you think that's funny, but it's actually true. I have no I'm doing the best I can. So, uh, so what I want to talk about today, and it's kind of what Lynn talked about, and it's kind of what the songs were about, and it's kind of what the church service has been about, is about um, the, the stories that people have and the songs about the miracles that God does. And I have a testimony that I'm going to share with you. But before I do that, I want to talk about something that is central to Easter, and the Easter story, and that is the body of Christ. Because you can't have Easter without the body of Christ. And that's a central part of the, the entire Easter story, right? The, um, everybody's seen you know, the movies, and they're beating the body of Christ, and they crucify the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is resurrected. And that's a central, the songs are about it, the praise leader will say, you know, we're going to uh, talk about the body of Christ. When you take communion, you take, uh, you take the cracker on, on a Friday night. I was the person that said it was the best church service I'd ever been to. And, um, and you take it, and they go, this is the body of Christ, and you, and you eat it. And, uh, and the body of Christ, the problem is the body of Christ doesn't exist on earth right now. 
Because the body of Christ has been resurrected and gone to heaven. So who's the body of Christ then? We are the body of Christ. The people in this room are the body of Christ. So if we are the body of Christ, that means we are responsible for doing the work that he would have done were he here. So all of us are a part of the body. And in 2 Corinthians, it describes each of us being a part of the body. And you're the hand, and somebody else is the foot, and somebody else is the ears, and somebody else is a different body part, and we all work together, and we all move. So I want to do a little experiment here. I've done this three times, and it's funny because some people actually have trouble with this. I want you to hold your hands out in front of you like this right here. Hold your hands out like this, and then look at the palms of your hands. And just see if you can open and close your hands like this. Most people can do that. It is possible that you can't do that. Some people, if you have an injury or something, you know, nerve isn't connected right up, you can't do that. All right, see if you can wiggle one of your toes. You can probably do that. If you're like my 91-year-old father here and he has eight toes, so he's got to be careful which one he's wiggling. You probably can hear, unless you have a hearing deficiency. You probably can see. You probably can speak. So what tells your hand to open and close? My hand open and closed. What tells your hand to open and close? Your brain, right? Your head. What's in your head? What's telling me to walk up and down these steps? My head. And my feet are listening to my head right now. And my feet are doing what my head is telling it to do. What happens if my feet don't do what my head tells it to do? I can't walk. I can't move forward. I can't work. I can't do anything. So when we sing sing the songs about stories, and we sing, uh, you hear, you know, Eli gets up and he talks about what God's done for, for him in his life. And Lynn talks about what uh, God's done. And Pastor Rick, he always has a story and he'll be like, and have you noticed a lot of the stories don't take place in church? In fact, most stories don't take place in church. Rick tells stories, he's like, I was out in the hog lot. <laughs> What's God doing in a hog lot? Um, and stories about things that take place outside of church. The reason those stories are happening is because the people that are in the body of Christ that are doing what he tells them to do, that are doing his work, are going to see God working. And they're going to experience the movement of God because they are doing what he tells them to do. So this morning, and I've said this, and Pastor Rick still hasn't corrected me. I'm not sure if this is biblically accurate or not. I don't have a lot of formal training when it comes to the Bible, is if you are thinking to yourself, why does everybody else have a miracle? Why does everybody else have a story? How come everybody else can get up and talk about all of the things that God's done for them? The reason the people are doing that is because they're seeing God work because they're doing his work and they see the miracles happen. So if you're missing out on that, it might be because you're not close enough to the work that God's doing to see the miracles happen. So I just wanted to share that, and Pastor Rick always talks about um, the practice field. Uh, if you don't come to church here on a regular basis, he, he re- recently or he frequently refers to the practice field, uh, it, meaning that if like God and Christ are the coach, you know, and you play football, you got to show up on the practice field. You got to do what the coach says. You have to uh, be put in the work, right? You can't just show up on game day and expect to play. You can't show up and expect to even know what the game plan is because you're not doing the work of God on the practice field. So, like I said, I'm not particularly special. There's nothing about me that's, you know, better than anybody else, but I do have a story. And I'm also a teacher, and Rick has said uh, both of us are teachers. I've been a teacher for 27 years, and um, 
<clears throat> I do. I spend all day long, every single day, with 120 12 year olds, and I'm not insane, <laughs> which is in and of itself a miracle. <laughs> and I don't ever get sick. Kids come to school, they're coughing and breathing and handing in papers and handing me stuff that they found and all this kind of stuff and standing close to me and touching me and everything else. I never get sick. I don't have a runny nose. I don't get a cough. I don't uh, get a sore throat. I never miss school. I've gone years and years without missing the day of school. And we went through COVID and COVID was a nightmare and people are wearing masks and we're wiping everything down with Clorox wipes and the kids are getting sick and they're quarantining and the, the teachers are sick and we don't have enough substitutes. And I was just like a pillar of uh, concrete and I just went, I, you can breathe on me. I never, I would just walk into a room and be like, I had no fear, and God told me not to worry about it. God said, don't worry about it. And then I opened my mouth, and I told Jim Abgar at Dagsboro Church, we were having one of those conversations. I'm sure no one in here has ever had one of these conversations. We were talking about Anthony Fauci. masks, vaccines. And I said, don't know what the big deal about COVID is. I haven't had so much as a runny nose. Three weeks later, I was dying in the hospital. <laughs> Can you put the picture up? That picture was taken. Two and a half months ago. And doctor said, uh, Mr. Pepper, you're very ill, and we're going to do what we can for you. And he, said, uh, and he said, I ended up on about seven different kinds of medication. One of them was some kind of experimental thing that I had to sign the paperwork, because when the nurse gave it to me, she said, we're not sure what's going to happen to you when they give you this. <laughs> That's when you're getting the good stuff that some science nerd made in a laboratory last week. You ever got the kind when they give it to you, you can feel it going through your body? That's the good stuff. And they gave me that. I was on, maxed out on oxygen. I was laying in a bed, about six or seven different kinds of medication. I ended up coming home and I had nursing care at home BB Hospital has this thing that's um, where the, under certain circumstances, depending on what your situation is, they actually allow you to go home. And I brought the medical equipment home with me, which was a blessing. I had an oxygen machine at my house. I had an IV at the house. I had a health monitor I was hooked up to. The nurses came to my house three times a day. They were giving me shots. They were checking on me and everything. And then after I went through all the treatments and had all the medication, I was still on the oxygen. <clears throat> but this is my story. The doctor said I was probably going to be in the hospital as much as two or three months. He also said, you might never go home. I was in the hospital one week. I got home, and the nurse, the nurses that came, they were like, you know, we do this, we... A lot of the people they were dealing with was older people. I was like the youngest one that they were coming to see. And uh, they said, you know, you, uh, you're pretty sick. You're going you to be a month or two. We're going to be coming out here. They had to come out to my house one week. I was maxed out on oxygen. The people that brought the oxygen said, you're probably going to be on oxygen a couple months, maybe six months. You have scar tissue in your lungs from the pneumonia. You're probably going to, this was January, and I was missing school, and they said, uh, you might as well take off the rest of the year. You're not going to be able to go back to school. You're not going to be able to teach with oxygen. You're not going to be able to breathe. You're not going to be able to talk. I was on oxygen for three weeks. I missed one month of school, and I went back to school after one month after they told me I was going to die. <laughs> and... 
And my doctor was in the last service, and um, he would get mad at me if I said, didn't say. And to me, it's a miracle. I did take medicine. I was in the hospital. But there were people praying for me. There were people in this church praying for me. There were people at the church I used to attend, Grace Church in Milton, that were praying for me. I even heard about an old Mennonite lady that lives in Ohio that was praying for me. I don't even know any old Mennonite ladies in Ohio. <laughs> and she was praying for me. And they were praying for me. And the Spirit of God filled me. And I was healed. And I would stop there, but Rick's going to make me tell this part of the story anyway. For some reason, it's his favorite part of the story. I don't know. So I teach sixth graders, and sixth graders, specifically boys, don't particularly like school a whole lot. I didn't like school a lot. I'm a teacher, and I didn't like school a whole lot when I was in school. And I have this kid, and he's a nice kid, but he doesn't like school a whole lot. He doesn't like my class a whole lot. He doesn't particularly like me a whole lot, which is shocking. (laughs) And I was gone. And I was gone one day, two days, and three days. I started getting messages. There's got to be some teachers in here, and we communicate with the kids on this thing called Schoology. There's got to be people in here that know what that is. And the kids send messages back and forth, and I can send messages to them. I started getting messages. Hey, Mr. Pepper, where are you? I was like, I'm sick. I'll be back. Hey, Mr. Pepper, you've been gone for a week. What are you doing? I was like, I'll be Okay. And then I started getting messages that said, my mom works in the hospital, and she said, you're dying. (laughs) I said, I believe that's a violation of some type of HIPAA law. (laughs) And I'm right back. I'm like, I'm in the hospital, you know. I was gone for a month. I got back to school. The day I got back to school, I missed an entire month of school. The very first day I got back to school, I had a, a meeting, a parent meeting. It was an IEP meeting about a student. There were four or five teachers. There was some, uh, there was the special ed coordinator and everything. And this, it's a Zoom meeting. And there's a mom who's, she's on one of the squares on the Zoom meeting. There's this mom sitting there. And the mom says, hey, nice to meet everybody. Uh, You guys are doing a great job with my son. And this son is the kid that doesn't particularly like me or like the class. I had been gone for an entire month. The special ed coordinator says, this is Mr. Pepper. He's going to represent, you know, his regular education. And the woman goes, Mr. Pepper? Did you say Mr. Pepper? And the guy said, yes, Mr. Pepper. I said, what, do you know another Mr. Pepper? She goes, well, you're, I thought you were, Someone said you were dying in the hospital. I said, I, I kind of was. I, I recovered very quickly. I didn't think I was going to recover. I didn't start preaching to her. That moment wasn't the time. And she started to cry. And I said, what are you crying about? And she said, my son, who doesn't like me or my class, she said, when my son goes to bed, I can hear him praying for you every day. So, God works in the lives of people that do His work. God bless you. Hey, Bill. I, I keep asking you to tell other parts of the story. <laughs> but uh, you, didn't, you didn't say that one part that while you were up here uh, oh. sharing last oh. night, something I forgot came all into about your that. head. Do you want to hear that part? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Plus. I'm sorry. So this is what happens when you don't write anything down. I know. But, I'm a- <laughs> but uh, you said when you first got in the hospital, they, they took you to a room yeah. where everybody was as bad as you were. Yeah. And uh, you're the only one. I lived, and the you're other the only two one that came died, out of yeah. the room. There yeah. were three of us, and the other two died, and I did. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that was just part part of that yeah. story that he was having to go through while they were saying, "You may not, you may not get out of here." 
and two of them didn't get out. Uh-huh. But uh, you said last I, night. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, last night part. while you were talking, something came into your thinking. Well, I, I'm sorry. I kind of ruined your uh, rest of your speech. Then. No, no, it's good. <laughs> the men in here will understand this. Women won't understand this. I didn't write anything down because I wanted to let the Holy Spirit flow through me. The problem is I have no idea what I'm saying. And last night in the middle of speaking, I was doing the same thing and I was talking about having COVID and all I could think about was pie. The reason I said men understand that is because there's men in this room right now thinking about pie. And you're like, we're going to go home, we're going to eat ham, and then I'm going to eat pie. Somebody in here is thinking about pie. And I'm preaching, tears are running down my face, people are raising their hands, people's lives are getting changed, and all I could think about was pie. And it occurred to me, this is true, I, it occurred to me, that somebody in the room right now is thinking, you know, these people, they're singing, they're being healed, their marriages are being fixed, there are people that, um, you know, miracles are happening, there's all these incredible things, and somebody in here is thinking to themselves, I wouldn't mind having a piece of that pie. (laughs) And if you're thinking to yourself, because it's a lot to take in, There was a lot of people up here singing. There's a lot of music. There's a lot happening. It's a lot to take in. But if in the back of your mind, you're like, I wouldn't mind having a piece of that pie. I don't know why that popped into my head. But God told me to think about it, I guess. And if you want a piece of that pie, today's the day. So Rick's going to come up and he's going to tell you how to get a piece of that pie. And... And I thought it was a little informal. I thought he was going to get mad at me. I thought he was going to be like, what are you talking about pie for in church? (laughs) But this morning on Easter Sunday, if you want a piece of that pie, you can find it right here. Uh. (laughs) Ah, I wanted him to say it. (laughs) Yeah, he basically said, because you could come into something like this and not understand the joy, not understand the excitement, or why would people actually put the time in to have to, to do all this, and are they really that happy? You know, uh, was Eli just saying words, or was he really meaning what he was saying? And the reality is, you don't have to understand God to come to him. You might not understand all this, but God can open up your heart. People come in religiously to something, and then suddenly they they have opportunity to be changed for the rest of their lives, and they don't know how it happened because you can't save yourself. You you cannot discover God on yourself. The Bible says you can only come to him when the Holy Spirit opens up your eyes. That's that thing you feel that says, I don't know why, but I'd like a piece of that pie. I, I sensed something, I felt something, and some of you may say, that's exactly how I came in. I was with people that I didn't understand their joy, or I didn't understand, I heard a testimony, I was like, what is that all about? But yet God opened up your eyes, opened up your heart, you had a hunger, and you knew suddenly there was something you didn't have. I did it in my own bedroom reading a, a chick track. And by the time that chick track was done, when I got reading that just a little teeny thing, I said, inside there was something that said, this is something you don't have. And as a 13-year-old, I didn't, didn't know how to explain it this way, but I got a piece of pie. <laughs> I tasted the kingdom. That's exactly what he does. Being born again is getting a taste of your future, where you're going. We won't understand all of it till we're there, but the Holy Spirit brings heaven to us here. 
and our lives are changed. It starts with a moment, the moment we believe. He gives us power for salvation. And you may be here today, and you're ready because God's made you ready. Your eyes are open, and now it's just being willing to say yes. So why don't we all stand? And we'll give you opportunity because somebody may be here right now because God has done exactly that. And you're ready to give your heart, your life over to him. I can lead you in a prayer of you committing your heart, your life to him. Your brothers and sisters that have done this, they're going to be happy for you. And they'll also say the prayer with you. They'll celebrate in what you're doing. But you need to be bold and confess Christ before men and women. Be willing to raise that hand and say, it's me, Pastor Rick. Right now I see my need. And I want to give my heart and my life over to Christ. I want to thank him for the cross. I want to thank him that he's showing me he is for real, that the living God is speaking to me right now. And I will surrender the throne of my life because that was my problem. I believed in God. I was religious, but I was in charge. If this is your day to surrender to him, then hallelujah for that. If that's you, brother, sister, be bold, raise that hand, and we'll say this prayer with you, committing your heart to the living God. Anybody want that prayer right now? Raise your hand up high so we can see it, so we can say this prayer together. Anybody need that prayer? Come on, is anybody? Where are we at? Where are we at? Right here, sis? Okay. Amen. Praise God. I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? We got the lady here. Yep. Anybody else? All right. Don't see anybody else. Well, thank God somebody was brave enough to raise their hand. Maybe somebody else is here. You, you wanted to, but you were too afraid to do it. Well, when we say this prayer, mean it, mean it in your heart. God will know that. So let's say this prayer together. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. The words I've heard. You have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me now. Teach me the ways of Jesus, that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your word that as I do this, I can confess by faith that I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. Right there, yep. All right, we got a packet here for you. Yes, got a packet here for you. And in that, there's some, there's some helps there for getting started. And did you also? Amen. Did we miss that? Amen. Praise God. And yeah, amen. And, uh, and, and there's, so there's two here, right here. Uh, but also, if anybody else, if you meant that prayer, uh, I want you to, as soon as the service is over, I want you to go over here where Pastor Ken and, and Lynn are going to be. They'll, they'll pray with you and invest in that. We've got a brand new Bible for you if you need it. But we all say, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Amen. Now for the rest of us, you know what you got? Seven days before we get back here. Let's not waste this week. Let's have this incredible walk with the Lord. He's ready to give you stories. How's he do it? We walk with him all week and watch what he'll do. He does the incredible. Let's be ready to have a good week. Amen. Well, Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for these ones that have given their hearts to the Lord. Thank you for the messages that we heard. Lord, I don't know what you spoke to all the hearts, but Lord, let us yield to anything you did say. 
And may we walk out of this place filled with your presence, ready to have a wonderful week in the Lord. May you shine through us. May people see your glory. And may you receive all the honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.